In this video, we're going to discuss heat and calorimetry. Now, when discussing the first law of thermodynamics, we've introduced heat as a type of energy. And we established that the first law tells us that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So in accordance with the first law of thermodynamics, if you've defined a system and surroundings, the sum of the uh, heat transfer of your system and surroundings must equal zero. This is the same way of mathematically stating that the energy can't be created nor destroyed. What this sets up is an interplay between the heat transfer of your system and surrounding such that if heat is gained by your system, heat is lost by the surroundings and vice versa. If system loses heat, then that heat is going to be gained by the surroundings. Just basically saying that there's no random outside body that can transfer heat to something in your universe that you're studying. So what I've set up here is a, a universe, our system and surroundings. And specifically, they're at two different temperatures, T1 and T2. And I've uh, put here that T1 is going to be greater than T2. So T1 is a higher temperature than T2. Um, and so that means there's going to be a heat transfer from the system to the surroundings, right? Whatever is at a higher temperature is going to transfer heat to the object with lower temperature. Or we say that heat flows from the hotter body to the cold body. Right, so heat flows from the hot body to the cold body. Right, and this um, transfer of heat is going to occur until thermal equilibrium is established, right? So you're going to have this transfer of heat, in this case, from the system to the surroundings until they establish thermal equilibrium. So you can imagine this system and surroundings set up being, you know, something like a chemical reaction uh, where the surrounding is some type of water bath. Um, and so if the system, the chemical reaction is exothermic, it's releasing heat into the surroundings, that transfer of heat is going to continue until thermal equilibrium is established. Now, what's happening on a molecular level, right? So we talked about kinetic molecular theory, where there's this intrinsic, um, you know, relationship between the heat that's added, the temperature, and your, uh, the kinetic energy of your particles. So if the system is losing heat, what that means is that on a molecular level, the molecules of the system would be losing kinetic energy. So the system molecules lose kinetic energy, while oppositely, right, the uh, molecules of the surroundings are going to be gaining kinetic energy, right? So the surroundings molecules gain kinetic energy, right? And I should point out this uh, notation of a subscript SYS and SURR is pretty consistent um, in thermodynamics as far as denoting variables that are uh, related to your system and your surroundings respectively, right? So this gives us a general macroscopic view of how heat is transferred from one body to the next and also what's happening on a molecular level uh, bet uh, between the system and surrounding. So uh, depending on which one is gaining or losing heat, the molecules are also going to be uh, gaining or losing kinetic energy, right? So one key thing to realize here, and it, it may sound simple on its face, but it's something to make sure that you understand early on in your studies of thermodynamics. Heat and temperature are two completely different things, right? Um, heat is a type of energy, right? Whereas uh, temperature is a way to measure the accumulation of thermal energy, right? These are two related things, but they're not exactly the same. So the equation for um, a change in heat, dq, right? So we have dq is going to be equal to some constant, uh, well, I should just say some uh, property C times dt which is our change in temperature. So you can see that they're related, but they're not exactly the same. And, and that crux between them is this quantity C, which is known as the heat capacity. So this is our heat capacity 
And this is going to be a very important quantity for us in thermodynamics. What the heat capacity is, is the amount of heat necessary to change the temperature by one unit, right? So this is the amount of heat needed to raise T by one unit. Right, and usually that unit is degrees Celsius, but um, in a general definition of heat capacity, any unit of temperature would suffice. So, um, by definition, um, the heat capacity is an extensive property. Um, we define certain, uh, so let me, let me back up. So the heat capacity, its units uh, would be something like joules per degree C, right? Now, this may be a ratio, but this is a ratio that has nothing to do with the system size, so it's still an extensive property. So we define certain uh, intensive versions of the heat capacity um, in order to bring back in uh, or in order to create intensive properties uh, based on the heat capacity. So one is the molar heat capacity. Right. And so that would just be joules per mole per degree C. And the other is the specific heat capacity. Right, so you might be very familiar with this from general chemistry. Uh, the specific heat is just joules per gram per degree C, right? So these are intensive properties that are defined um, as a, an analog to the extensive heat capacity, right? So now, how do we measure this stuff? So the way that we measure this stuff is uh, something called calorimetry, right? Now, calorimetry is, ju is just very simply the science of measuring heat. So this is the science of measuring heat. Right, so the so calorimetry is going to deal all with this equation, right? So the change in heat is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. Calorimetry is all about trying to utilize this equation to quantify heat change, and one way to do that is constant volume calorimetry, right? So uh, a type of constant volume calorimetry is the figure that you see on the left, a bomb calorimetry. So constant volume calorimetry. And one type of that is this bomb calorimeter that you see on the left. So let's go through this figure. So basically, you have a sample that you're interested in. So your sample is in some vessel. And it's uh, a constant volume rigid container. So you're not having a change in volume inside your uh, sample uh, container. It is inside a vessel where uh, the sample can be ignited and there can be a combustion reaction that can take place inside this vessel. So these ignition wires ignite your sample and cause combustion. Uh, all of this, your entire vessel, is submerged in a water bath on the outside of your container that's kept at a constant temperature in order to make sure that there's no uh, residual heat loss from your sample to your bath, right? So the Water bath is continually uh, stirred and maintained at a consistent temperature to ensure that there's no um, heat lost or gained from the water bath to your to your sample. Right. So if this is a, a constant volume uh, calorimetry container. Right. Let's think about how this could help us uh, get to the in, uh, the actual energy of our sample. If we start from the first law of thermodynamics, right? If we have du is equal to dq plus dw, right? So if we have this as the first law of thermodynamics, if we assume pressure volume work, right? Then we can plug in the pressure volume work expression that we derived in the previous video, right? So we had negative p external dv, right? So this is for PV work, and I'll be abbreviating pressure volume work as PV work uh, throughout this class. So this is if we assume PV work, 
Um, so considering that this type of calorimeter is a constant volume calorimeter, well, that means that this whole term is going to go away because dV is zero. Right? dV is going to be zero if there's no change in volume. So this whole work term goes away. Right? And so you're just left with du being equal to dq at constant volume. And I'll put a subscript v there to denote that we're looking at this specifically at constant volume. Well, what does that look like? So if we plug in our expression for dq, so plugging in this guy, right? then we're going to have our heat capacity at constant volume dt, right? So um, the heat capacity can be uh, expressed in constant volume or constant pressure, and we'll talk more in detail about this in the next video. But um, assuming that we have the heat capacity at constant volume, this will be our differential expression to denote the internal energy. What you'll note here is that it only depends on this change in temperature. So that's why calorimetry is so important because you can get directly at the internal energy of your compound or your sample, whatever your system is, um, just by looking at a relatively simple change in temperature, how it reacts, uh, how it reacts and causes a change in temperature. So um, in order to get our total change, right? So we want to turn this into a, a, a total change from our differential expression. So in order to do that, we have to integrate Right, so you'll measure some temperature change. You'll have some initial temperature T1, final temperature T2, CV dt. Now, if we assume that uh, CV is a constant, which will not always be the case, so we're going to look at uh, examples where the heat capacity varies with respect to temperature. But for this case, let's assume that uh, CV is constant, and you, sometimes it is. So you've solved a lot of problems, probably in general chemistry before where um, heat capacity at constant volume is, is constant. So in this case, we can take it out of the integral. If we do that, then we end up with the following expression, CV delta T, right? So when doing constant volume calorimetry, right, we get this expression where if we can measure a temperature change, right, a simple temperature change for our sample, then we end up getting at the change in internal energy for our sample as well. And so this is just one example of how heat can be very important in you know, solving for internal properties of our systems in thermodynamics. Um, but this is just you know, one example. And like I said, we'll go into more detail into this uh, concept of heat capacity uh, in the next video.